Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Welcome to Dark Poutine. My name is Mike Brown. I am the creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend Scott Hemingway. Say hello, Scott. What's poppin', y'all? Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on any of the topics we present, nor are we professional journalists. We're just two regular Canadians interested in crime and the darker side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque. Grab yourself a double double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. Mm. <laughs> So we've made it over the hump, episode 51. Yeah, right? So now we're 49 away from 100. Well, when you phrase it like that, it doesn't seem very close. It's pretty far. It's pretty far. Well, it took us over a year to get to 50. So by my math, we'll get to 100 in 7.4 years? No. Uh No, that is incorrect. (laughs) Sounds like a math problem. Our first away game was in two parts. So we didn't do one for a while, and I kind of miss doing them. Yeah, they're fun. We didn't want to lose our unique focus on Canadian crime and history, but I really, 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 really wanted to do this episode. Uh, Yeah, yeah, and me as well. I I was going to say it's a fun one, but um, murder isn't something you should label fun. Well, especially the way that this dude did it. Yes, yes. So I, I, I guess I should say it's a hot one. No? No, maybe not. No? The subject of this episode has been gnawing on my brain for some time. (laughs) He's someone whose horrific crimes have fascinated me for as long as I can remember. He's an OG, this guy. No. Oh. Yeah. I thought you said he's an OG, this guy. (laughs) No, I said he's an OG. Original gangster. Okay. I was going to say he's no Jesus. Well, he isn't. Yeah. This true story has been retold as fiction. Mm-hmm. frequently. This man is pointed to as the inspiration for many books, films, and even some music. Some of the most recognizable and perennial favorite horror movie villains are based on this guy and his depraved endeavors. Hell yeah. Characters such as Norman Bates of Psycho, <coughs> Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes. Oh, love, 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 love Texas Chainsaw And Massacre. James Gum. Or Buffalo Bill from Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, I hadn't really put that together, but... It is absolutely the truth. Yeah. As you read through this episode, as we talk about things, you will see. Well, yeah, no, like, after you mention it, it's like, oh, yeah, shit, that makes total sense. This is the story of the ultimate mama's boy, murderer, presumed serial killer, body snatcher, and crafty creep, the butcher of Plainfield, Wisconsin... Edward Theodore, or simply Ed Gein. We'll endeavor to tell as much fact in this story as we can, as some of what exists in the zeitgeist about Ed is more fiction than fact. We don't want to add to the myth if we can help it. Unless it doesn't contain unicorns, because then I'm going to add unicorns. Well, you just did. Because it's myth. There you go, it's done. Woo! Before we go any further, we want to let you know, dear listeners, that this will be a particularly graphic episode. You've been warned. Yes. Yes, you have. In many rural communities, the opening of deer hunting season is anticipated eagerly by local hunters. It was this way in Plainfield, Wisconsin on the morning of November 16th, 
1957. The small town was nearly deserted as the bulk of its residents went to their favorite hunting spots with the hope of bagging a large whitetail. Some hunt for meat to help their families through the snowy Wisconsin winters. Others hunt for sport. Their aim? To take down a massive buck with a huge set of antlers to have stuffed and display on the walls of their trophy rooms. They'd later brag to their buddies about the efforts involved in the destruction of such a beautiful creature. But there was another kind of hunter out and about that day. He prowled the vacant downtown streets for the prey he'd had his eyes on for some time. And then he struck. Frank Warden, a deputy with the Plainfield Sheriff's Department, came back to town after that afternoon. He had been out hunting himself on opening day. Frank hadn't gotten a deer yet, but he knew he had a few days to get out again and claim his prize for the year. He went to Mashinsky's gas station just across the street from his mum's drugstore. The gas station held a contest every year for the biggest buck. He wanted to see if anybody had bagged anything yet. Right away, Mushinsky mentioned to Frank that he'd noticed something odd. Mushinsky had seen the panel van from Frank's mother's drugstore peel out of the parking lot at about 9.30 a.m. He didn't see who was driving. The store had been closed all day. This was unusual as Bernice had told everybody that she wasn't going to go hunting that day. She'd wait till a few days in. She wanted to keep her store open in case anybody needed anything. Frank walked across the street to find the door was locked and the close sign was in place. After racing home and acquiring his spare key for the store, Frank entered. From Deviant, true story of Ed Gein, the original Psycho by Harold Schechter. As soon as he stepped inside, he saw that something was terribly wrong. The cash register was missing from its counter, and the floor was spattered with reddish-brown stains which led in a trail to the back door, and which Warden instantly recognized as blood, a great deal of blood. Running to the rear, he looked into the driveway. Wyshynski was right. The store's panel truck was gone. Warden was alarmed, but didn't panic. He'd been a deputy sheriff for nearly a year, and he knew how to proceed. End quote. Frank called for backup. When the sheriff and another deputy arrived to assist, they found Frank Warden distraught inside the store. He suspected someone right away. A man who some people felt was a bit off had been hanging around Bernice's store recently. He was continually asking her out on dates, but she would calmly refuse him. His name? Eddie Gein. The sheriff and his deputies fanned out looking for Ed at his usual spots. Word of Bernice's disappearance and the apparent violence involved spread quickly across the little town. Cops found Ed in his car in the parking lot of a local business. He'd just been inside chatting calmly with others about Bernice Warden's disappearance over coffee. Ed was acting more strange than usual. His story was not adding up or making much sense. When asked about Mrs. Warden, he said, Well, she's dead, ain't she? Ed was taken into custody pending a search of his property. Little did these small town police officers know, a scene of unimaginable horror awaited them in the darkness of the Gein homestead. Not only would these images be burned into their heads, they would haunt the dreams of many others all over the Midwest and the rest of the world as people learn the details of Eddie's depraved extracurricular activities. Yeah, having seen some of the photos and a, a lot of photos of what they found, I can see why this would be burnt into their uh, their heads. And we'll get into detail. In yeah, a yeah, it's, it's it's yeah. I yeah, I, I don't think anybody could go into there and not leave. You can't leave the same as yeah, when you went in. You would definitely be messed up for sure. 
So before we take you all the way into Ed Gein's deep, dark cavern of horror, let's learn a little bit more about the man and where he came from. I'm going to assume it's the typical story of a great childhood, lots of friends, uh, great, great with animals. No. Oh! Well, I don't know about the animals part because there's not a lot about that, but Wisconsin doesn't seem to be the kind of place one would think crimes like those of Ed Gein's would even be possible. Well, I mean, Wisconsin doesn't really pop into many people's heads often, I don't think. I've been through there. Have you? Yeah, on Is it my nice? way back, yeah. We'll talk about that as we go. The state of Wisconsin, it's actually situated in the upper northern portion of the Midwestern United States. Yeah. I drove, I say, actually stayed in Madison, Wisconsin on my trip back home. Oh. It borders two great lakes, Michigan and Superior. And many of the settlers through the 1800s and early 1900s are of Germanic or Scandinavian descent. Hmm. I think Gein is Germanic. It sounds like it, yes. Wisconsin is known for its dairy industry, in particular its cheese. Mm -hmm. The rabid fans of their NFL team, the Green Bay Packers, are referred to as cheese heads. And often wear cheese upon their heads. That's right. As you should. Yeah, I guess so. You know, yeah. I mean, we all wear poutine hats in Canada. No, we don't. Oh. That's a myth. Oh, I thought we did. It's a myth that's probably never going to get going either. Damn. As with the people of many other Midwestern states, Wisconsinites are typically hardy and hardworking folks. Yeah. There are some stories that point to a darker side of the state. One book I recommend is called Wisconsin Death Trip. Oh. And it's written by Michael Lessie in 1973. And the book is actually a collection of photos taken in Black River Falls, Wisconsin from 1890 to 1900. It's complemented by text from the local newspaper, the Badger State Banner. All of this depicts a creepier side to the turn of the century Wisconsin living. Hmm. Highlights include death, crime, insanity, fires, bankruptcies, epidemics, suicide, untimely deaths of local young people in harsh conditions. Pretty morbid, but uh, I do find that stuff quite uh, quite fascinating from a photographer perspective. It, uh, you want photos that hit people and create emotion, and uh, those photos do that. I would rather not have take those photos. But... Yeah. Well, I'll let you have a look at the book I have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sweet. I mean... Okay. Okay, just for curiosity's yeah, sake. Yes, yes, Ed Gein's mother, Augusta, and his father, George, were married on December 4th, 1899 in La Crosse, Wisconsin. George Gein was, at the time when he married Augusta, an apprentice blacksmith, but he loved to drink. His alcoholism quickly put the kibosh on that apprenticeship. <laughs> Augusta was a devoutly religious woman who needed to get married. She was 19 and almost an old maid when George came courting. It's crazy to think that 19 was considered like, oh, you're past your prime. Augusta was a rigid and judgmental woman, and she wore the pants in the family. George's drinking got him into trouble at work and at home. We weird how that works, eh? Yeah. Hmm. Augusta loathed George for his moral weakness and lack of ambition, <laughs> including his alcoholism. Jeez. She let him know just how much every chance she got. Uh, yeah. Wow. She does sound charming. She openly berated him, calling him a lazy dog. Nothing like love. Nice, nice lady. Yeah. Nothing like love. But Augusta wanted a child, and this seemed the only use that she had for George. <laughs> <laughs> wow. In 1902, Henry, Ed's older brother, was born. Oh, okay. Welcome, Henry. Welcome. Welcome to this wonderful, loving home. George was still struggling to find any meaningful work. He'd burn bridges as a tanner, farmhand, and a carpenter. Hmm. George himself was no shy wallflower, though. He took his rage out on Henry and later young Ed, abusing the boys mentally, emotionally, and physically. Yeah, fuck this guy. Augusta became pregnant again, and I, I'm thinking, like, how does that even happen? I'm sure in, in even the most vile relationships like that there's got to be a few moments where things are chill i guess i you know I, i'm just trying to i'm just trying to picture how it happens but just uh, everything i read is that these were both awful people fine i'll let you do it then fine you bet you better be quick oh god yeah edward theodore Gein was born on august 27th 1906 also in La Crosse, wisconsin into the already dysfunctional and unhappy family. 
Gusta became the breadwinner, of course, resentfully running a local grocery business that George had initially purchased, but was incapable of managing effectively because he was drunk all yeah, the time. Yeah, again, that'll do. Augusta was very protective of Eddie, but as he was a male child, he was born, according to her, flawed. Well, I can't argue with that. Many times she told him only a mother could love him. Jeez. Isn't that nasty? Jeez, the what a terrible home. <laughs> Holy shit. It's just awful. Although I'm suddenly feeling like I'm like just the best parent super ever. Dad. Yeah. Jesus. Scott's super dad. Yeah. I've never told my, my kids that only their father could love them. No. No. Because that's awful. So I'm a winner. I guess so. In 1913, Augusta decided that farming should be the main family business. So she sold off the store and bought their property in Plainfield. It was not because she wasn't doing well. It was because she hated the city. Oh, I, I think she probably hates a lot of things. It was a devilish place okay. filled with evil and godless people. Okay, so the whole city is wrong, not her. All of the, this city of La Crosse, Wisconsin that I have never heard of before. No offense to people in La Crosse, but I had just never heard of the place before. Yes, yeah. and I bet you it's probably a love, lovely place. She, though, on the other hand... Seems to be the common denominator. <laughs> right? Augusta wanted her family closer to God, and in her mind... Farming was the most honest labor a person could do. I have so much respect for farmers. That's that, that's serious work, man. Yes. So I'm with her on that one. The nearest neighbors of the 195-acre farm were over a kilometer away. Yeah, that's Canadian. Uh, for about a half a mile. Yeah, yeah. The further, the better, according to Augusta. <laughs> <laughs> Ed had a growth on his left eye that made his eye droop, giving him a lazy-eyed look. Okay. He also had a small lesion on his tongue that gave him an odd way of speaking. Okay, well, that's unfortunate. These things, coupled with his odd personality, made him a target of the other kids at the one-room school. Yeah. Not... So they began to bully Eddie yeah. Gein. Which, I mean, no matter how he turned out, I'm, I'm not cool with, with what happened Bullying, to him. Yeah. no. Eddie would laugh at inappropriate times and was often caught staring with an odd look on his face at uncomfortable female classmates. Oh, jeez. Yeah. Hmm. I think it might have been all the things that his mother was telling him about women and girls mm -hmm. and how they were unclean, mm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, jeez. He always wanted to fit in. He even tried to mimic the behavior of other children, but this made him look even stranger. As it will. And it's sort of a sign of a sociopathic or psychopathic personality pretending or trying to mimic other people's reactions to things. Well, yeah, it is, but it's also, it's a fine line between somebody who's just uh, on the outside trying to fit in versus somebody who is doesn't feel and is mimicking others to make it seem like they feel. Yeah. I, I do need, I feel nothing. From Harold Schechter's book, Deviant, The True Story of Ed Gein, he didn't seem to like other boys. There was something about his mannerism, the softness of his voice, the meekness of his posture, the nervous fluttering motions his hands made when he talked. That struck them as distinctly girlish. He had another effeminate trait, too. He cried very easily. He certainly couldn't take a joke. Yeah, in the early 1900s, I don't. I, I think uh, men crying doesn't go over as well as it does now because, like, I cry all the time and people dig it. Exactly. So it's rural Wisconsin in the early 20th century. Yeah. And you are a tearful young man. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was overly sensitive as a kid, too. Mm -hmm. Same. And uh, yeah, I was made fun of for that at yeah. points. And it was, that was the 70s and the 80s. I yes. can't imagine the early <laughs> yes. 20th century. Yes what was expected of a young man not, to be a man instantly. Not crying. Not crying. That's one of the criteria. Uh, boys were expected to be men. Yes. Eddie was displaying far from what was expected of him. Even when he did manage to make a friend, Augusta typically did not approve of the family forbidding Ed to interact with other children because they weren't as good as them. <laughs> Augusta wished she could keep her boys, Henry and Ed, isolated from the influences of the outside world completely. Her direction was all they needed. Jeez, this woman is not well. 
Augusta continually drove home that Ed and Henry should remain virgins forever and never let a woman contaminate them. What? Wow. Why does she hate women so much? Great question. Wow. This is probably why Eddie would run away whenever the other kids were talking about anything sexual. Oh, I would imagine. Because he's, yeah. Because as you're growing up, kids are going to be talking about yeah, that stuff. And, and you have that one guy with the weird reaction who just takes <laughs> off. And says, my mommy says that I'm not supposed to listen to this. Another one of those things on the list of what you don't do as a man in the early 1900s. Exactly. Yep. Also from Harold Schechter's book, Deviant, True Story of Ed Gein. Cut off from all social contacts, completely separated from life of the community, condemned to an existence of crushing poverty in a remote and desolate region with two tormented and inimical parents, Eddie never emotionally strong to begin with, was retreating further and further into a private world of fantasy. The Gein farm may not have been productive, but it was proving to be a fertile breeding ground for madness. Uh, madness was, uh, was a brew in that house. Oh, for sure. Eddie was bull bullied and beaten in school, as well as at home. He had no respite from it, as far as we can tell. Mm -hmm. Augusta told Eddie and Henry regularly that they were destined for failure, just like their father, because they were men. <sighs> Okay, oh, so she hates men as well. So women and men. People. She just... Uh, hu humanity. <clears throat> she hates Earth. Well, they were sinners, Scott. Yeah, uh, clearly. Rather than keep trying, Eddie quit school at 14 and began working on the farm with his mother and brother, thus isolating him even more. It also left him with a grade 8 education, but it wasn't terrifically uncommon in rural areas yeah. at the time. Yeah. When Eddie was 31, his father George had become a complete invalid. He was ill all the time and lived only to drink, so mm. his alcoholism was getting to him. Yeah. Augusta resented George even more now, and he was simply a parasite living off the hard work of she and the boys. So you're sick, you're an invalid, and she's going to treat you even worse now. Yeah. Yeah. Awful. Yeah, she's... Ugh. George Gein suffered for another three years, and finally on April 1st, 1940... He died of fluid on the lungs caused by pneumonia at the age of 66. It was probably a relief. Yeah, I was just exactly what I was going to say. He was not missed by Augusta. Oh, you don't say. He'd been a drain on the meager earnings of the farm that was never profitable. In 1942, as World War II was raging, as with many men at the time, Ed was drafted and told to report to Milwaukee for his physical. Okay. Eddie's drooping left eyelid impaired his vision, making him ineligible for service. Just another place he didn't fit in. It's kind of like bone spurs. Can't get in because of bone let's, spurs. Let's not go there. <laughs> Apparently, the trip to Milwaukee was the furthest Ed had ever been away from home, approximately 115 miles, and he would never venture that far on his own again. Oh, wow. Although his focus was the farm... Eddie did do odd jobs for people around Plainfield. Even though he was a weirdo, they felt he did a solid job at whatever handyman task he set out to do. On Tuesday, May 16th, 1944, tragedy struck the Gein home again. Mm. Ed and Henry had been attending to a fire in the marsh on their property. It's unclear whether the blaze was accidental or intentionally set to clear brush. Ed later told authorities that at some point he and Henry lost control of the fire and then Ed lost sight of Henry. Oh. Ed claimed it was at that point that he decided to get help. Mm -hmm. Having claimed he lost track of his brother was interesting as Ed led sheriff's deputies directly to Henry, who lay there dead. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you don't know where he is, how can you bring them right to him? You don't know where he is, but Here, there he is. There he is. Yeah. I don't know where he is. Let me bring you to him. Henry had not been burned in the fire, although his clothes were dirty with soot. There were bruises on the back of his head. Um. The post-mortem declared that Henry had died of asphyxiation due to smoke inhalation, and he was laid to rest. Yeah, but bruises? Did the smoke beat him upon the head? Good question. The smoke monster Maybe from he Lost? fell down multiple times on his head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, clearly, that's it. In hindsight, one might think Ed probably killed Henry to keep Augusta all to himself. Yeah, I, I get that feeling. Henry had been known to challenge Augusta from time to time, which Ed didn't like. 
And I would imagine Augusta didn't either. Yeah, it was an unforgivable sin in her mind mm -hmm. and that of her youngest son who saw her as perfect. She was God to Ed. Yeesh. She's not God. No. I just feel that I... If there is one, it ain't her. Yeah, exactly. Holy crap. The devil, maybe. Not long after Henry died, in the summer of 1944, Augusta got sick and had to be hospitalized. She'd had a stroke. Oh. Eddie was distraught. The woman who'd been his source of strength was unable to care for herself at all. She needed attention day and night. Eddie, neglecting his work on the farm, was there for her as much as he could be. Mm -hmm. He took care of all her personal needs. Wow. She had Eddie read Bible verses to her over and over. I guess there was no matlock to put on back then. <laughs> I guess not. When she began recovering slightly, her anger returned too with a vengeance. <laughs> Trying to walk again, Eddie would attempt to help, but was rebuffed and told to go away. She wanted to do it on her own. Eddie was glad to see Augusta up and about. Even though she slowed down considerably, she was getting better. Good? For a time, at least. Oh. <laughs> However, on December 28th, 1945, Augusta had another stroke. This one was fatal. Eddie was inconsolable at her funeral. He was said to have blubbered and cried like a child. He didn't make any sense in what he was saying. He was now completely alone in this world. Damn. Like, I'm thinking, like, phew. His best friend and the only woman he believed capable of ever being able to love him was gone. Ugh, I'm uncomfortable. Ed sank into a maudlin depression. As he was a loner, no one noticed much that Ed's behavior from this point on became increasingly bizarre, as what was left of his sanity slipped away. The people in Plainfield noticed Ed had really let himself go. His appearance was never exactly that of someone put together, but after his mother's death, he seemed to have given up on grooming. He was cutting his own hair, he had a stubbly beard, and his clothes were dirty and disheveled. Did they have flobies back then? No. Uh, if you don't know what a floby is, just uh, look it up. It. The Gein farm was looking just as unkempt from the outside as its sole occupant, Ed. He kept the livestock on the farm only briefly after his mother's death. Unable to keep up, he just sold them off. Mm. Also to keep his head above water, Ed sold off a nearby 80-acre parcel of land that had belonged to his brother. And in 1951, Ed began receiving a subsidy from the federal government for the farm. That helped a bit too. Yeah. Ed boarded up all but two rooms of the farmhouse after Augusta died, leaving the rooms on the second floor untouched for years. Well, that's kind of odd. He used only the kitchen and a room directly off it as his bedroom. The rest of his house was off limits, even to Ed. Yeah, well, that's bizarre. Perhaps he wanted to preserve it like a shrine to his mother, or perhaps he just didn't want to have to bother cleaning or heating it. Either way, that's bonkers. The rooms he did keep were a mess of garbage, food scraps, and other things that Ed had collected. Hmm. Ed began hanging out in the Plainfield graveyard. People believed he was there visiting Augusta and Henry. He missed them dearly. That may have been partially true, but later other motives would become evident. Mm -hmm. Oddly, Ed was seen frequenting other cemeteries as well between 1947 and his arrest in 1957. Oh, well, I mean, they're quiet. I like cemeteries, yeah. actually. I, I like to go there and meditate. Yeah, they're quiet. Ed continued doing errands and other handyman tasks and odd jobs on other farms like lending a hand at harvest or lugging hay for folks around town. Sometimes after a shift at a local farm, Ed would get invited for dinner as part of his pay, or sometimes plain old neighborliness. Huh, would he go? I wonder. Yeah, he'd sit there and eat, and after finishing up, he'd be leering at the farmer's wife or daughters, creeping them out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, given everything about his life to this point, yeah, you would imagine it's only going to continue to get creepy for him. When Ed was socializing and when he did speak, he talked a lot about the books that he was reading. Oh. Even though he had an eighth grade education, he still loved to read. But the topics which he would discuss gleefully were disturbing to some of the other Plainfield residents and somewhat telling in hindsight. Mm -mm. Ed's reading ranged from Grey's Anatomy. Oh, they had that show back then? 
No. Oh. The book with the human anatomy. Oh. oh yeah, oh, I have that. I'll make sure to look at it. I don't. Uh, he read pulpy adventure magazines with sometimes gory photos depicting cannibal tribes of the Amazon and South Pacific who kept shrunken heads of their victims as trophies. Now, that is pretty fascinating stuff. It is fascinating. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's more it's more fascinating for younger people, but yeah. I don't know. My grandmother read Weekly World News, so wow, about we, Bat Boy and all that kind of stuff. We had National Geographic. That too. <laughs> There were even rumors around Plainfield that Creepy Ed Gein had shrunken heads of his own, but no one really wanted to believe that this meek, seemingly harmless old farmer could keep such a thing. Oh, no. Not not Eddie. He loved true crime magazines, like oh. True Detective. Oh, shit. These magazines were well known to outline horrendous crimes, sometimes with graphic and bloody crime scene photos of or reenactments. So there's probably another Ed Gein listening to us right now. Oh, that's that's comforting. Don't do it. Yes, don't. Don't do it. Don't. L listen to dark poutine and don't do it. Yeah, get your outlet by listening, yes. not by doing. Yes. Ed was fascinated by stories like that of Burke and Hare, Scottish murderers, grave robbers, and body snatchers from the 1800s. Ed's eyes would light up as he talked about their nighttime escapades of digging up the corpses of the recently deceased and selling them to medical schools as learning cadavers. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, well, I, I'm hearing this and I'm thinking like, well, we do a true crime podcast. Like this stuff isn't, but if you're thinking back to mid-1900s, back then, I don't think this would be a typical dinner table conversation. No. Uh, one day we'll do the story of Burke and Harris in a way game because I find them rather interesting. They killed 16 people. I don't know if I even know that one. Well, guess what? You will. <laughs> Ed also lit up relating a harrowing tale of bored English bluebloods digging up freshly buried young women for necrophilic activity. Ed would refer to this as indecent purposes. Uh, yeah, disgusting is what I'd call it. Bloody disgusting. As World War II had just ended, there were many reports in books, magazines, and newspapers telling of the shocking and horrific atrocities that had been committed by Hitler and his Nazis throughout Europe. Ed gobbled these stories up like candy for his twisted brain. Mm -hmm. He became particularly excited when talking about the story of Ilse Koch, the wife of Karl Otto Koch, brutal Nazi prison warden, who was tasked with the building of the concentration and slave labor camp at Buchenwald. Yeah. Karl Otto had also been promoted to colonel in the SS, and Ilse became an SS Aufersheeren which is overseer at the camp. Mm. Ilsa was just as cruel as her husband, if not more so. She became known as the Bitch of Buchenwald. She would wear tight-fitting and revealing clothing around the camp to tempt male prisoners. If any dared look at her, or worse yet, became aroused, they were immediately shot in the head by the SS guards who followed her around. Holy shit. As well, Ilsa would ride her horse through the camp, ordering prisoners to strip. If the prisoner had a distinctive or particularly interesting tattoo, he or she was selected for medical experience that were taking place at the camp. Wow. After the inevitable death of the subject in the experiment, Ilsa had the skin with the tattoo specifically preserved so she could have household items made from the human leather as keepsakes or to give away as macabre pieces of art. Ooh, this is a terrible woman. Among the artworks were lampshades, gloves, book covers, and knife sheaths, all made of human skin. Holy shit. One rumor had Ilsa using human thumbs as light switches in her home. You've got to be kidding me. Ilsa and Carl Otto were even too evil for the Nazis, apparently. Carl Otto was charged with three unsanctioned murders in the prison camp, and Ilsa was charged with embezzlement of 700,000 Reichmarks. Hmm. Carl Otto was convicted and shot in 1945. Ilsa was acquitted for lack of evidence, but she did not escape justice. Oh. At the end of World War II, Ilsa was rounded up with other war criminals and charged with participating in a common criminal plan for encouraging, aiding, abetting, and participating in the atrocities at Buchenwald. Hmm. Well, good. Ed's eyes would light up while he was relating these horrific details to the common, God-fearing folks in Plainfield. Well, yeah, in hindsight... You can see why. Ilsa was found guilty by an American tribunal and sentenced to life in prison where, in 1967, she committed suicide at the age of 60. 
She is the inspiration for the violently pornographic 1975 film Ilsa She-Wolf of the SS. I'm not sure how that ever got made. It's awful. I've never even heard of it, but I, I do not have any interest in seeing it. Well, I watched uh, bits of it, and it's uh, it's disturbing. Yeah, well, just I, I, anything that in any capacity could glorify that terrible human being, I have no interest in. People started going missing in Wisconsin at the end of World War II. Three cases are as yet unsolved. Mm -mm. On May 1st, 1947... Eight-year-old Georgia Jean Weckler was dropped off at the end of her family's driveway but disappeared from there. A massive search turned up no sign of her, and she's not been seen since. Generation Y wrote about this case extensively on their blog. Mm. A pair of hunters, Victor Travis and Ray Burgess, spent some time at the tavern in November of 1952. They went off into the woods deer hunting and were never seen again. Another search turned up nothing. Hmm. Two people going missing at the Saint Lake, too. It's a very small area. Yeah. A year later, October 24th, 1953, in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Ed Gein's birthplace, a pretty 15-year-old girl named Evelyn Hartley was babysitting the 20-month-old daughter of a neighbor when she disappeared. Mm -hmm. There was blood found in the house and the yard, but no sign of Evelyn. Oh, jeez. She, too, has just vanished into the ether, still considered a missing person to this day. Ed Gein was suspected in these disappearances, but never confessed to any involvement in any of them. Some believe that all four bodies might be buried somewhere on the large parcel of land that once held the Gein farm, but that's just speculation. Yeah. The next case, though, is different. On December 8th, 1954, tavern keeper Mary Hogan disappeared from her Pine Grove, Wisconsin establishment between 5 and 6 p.m., Bloodstains in the form of drag marks led from the bar room out into the snowy parking lot where tracks from a parked vehicle were. A 32 caliber cartridge from an automatic pistol was found at the scene. Witnesses claimed to have seen a green Dodge truck at the tavern around the time of the incident. It wasn't until the police entered Ed Gein's home after his arrest that they found bits of what remained of Mary Hogan. Yeah, keyword bits. So now we're going to fast forward back to the day that Ed Gein was arrested. Mm -hmm. To the eyes of the investigating officers, the Gein's farmhouse and outbuildings were a house of horrors. After kicking a flimsy door to the attached shed at the back of the Gein home, the police entered. One police officer shining a light around in the darkened shed noticed rusty, long-retired tools and junk scattered about. Then he bumped into something heavy. Ugh. When he turned his flashlight to investigate, he saw a white corpse hung upside down by her heels and arms, gutted, decapitated, and bled out into a bucket like a deer or slaughtered livestock. Yeah, it's a disgusting scene. The rest of the house turned up more horrific arts and crafts of a clearly depraved mind. Yeah. Among the mess of garbage and broken dusty items in Ed's small rooms, police found an apron made from a patchwork of human skin, including faces, a vest with breasts and leggings of women's leg skin, no doubt the inspiration for fictional serial killer Buffalo Bill James Gum's woman suit in yep. Silence of the Lambs. Ed claimed he would wear this around the house, pretending to be his mother. My goodness. Oh... A corset of human flesh was also found. A wastebasket made with human skin. Wall hangings with various parts of the female anatomy, particularly genitals. A lampshade of human skin, just like Ed's hero, Ilsa Koch. Yeah. A belt made of nipples. Yes. Multiple skull bowls used for eating, along with tableware made of bones. Oh my, this is disgusting. Skull ashtrays. A set of chairs upholstered in human skin. Okay, how many people did... Because this is a lot of skin and bones and stuff. We'll get into it. Jeez. At least nine masks, including hair and eyelashes, made from women's faces. Ah. A necklace of five tongues strung together. Okay, well, everybody needs one of those, though. Gloves made from human skin. A pull cord for a shade made from a pair of lips. Oh, my dear. 
Bernice Warden's entrails had been wrapped up for disposal. Her head was in a sack nearby. (sighs) Ed later claimed he'd never eaten anyone, but popular lore paints him as a cannibal. As far as I can find in the research, it's either untrue or Ed simply never confessed to it. Well, a lot lot of the time when serial killers eat uh, their victims, it's because they want them to be... Close apart, and, yeah, they want to be close, and so if Ed he, was a very lonely guy, and, and if he's wearing your skin, he, he definitely wants you close. Eating parts of people wouldn't be very, uh, it wouldn't be a far stretch to assume he did that. The press ran with the grisly details of the finds in Ed Gein's home as they leaked out quickly. Ed admitted right away to the murder of Bernice Worden, although he claimed to have been in a daze at the time and didn't remember much detail. He remembered dragging Warden's body to his Ford truck and taking the cash register from the store. He took them back to his house, but he didn't recall shooting Bernice in the head, as he did with a twenty two caliber rifle, according to the autopsy report. Hmm. He later also admitted to having been the man who abducted and murdered Mary Hogan. Her face and other body parts had been found at his home, as well as the 32 caliber German automatic handgun he'd used to murder her. Her face was found at home, not not her head. That stands out to me. Her face was found at his home. Wow. He admitted that he had killed two women, although questioned about Georgia, Georgia Jean Weckler, Victor Travis, Ray Burgess, and Evan Hartley, he did not know anything he said about those crimes. Mm. He went into detail over time about the other partial bodies found in his home, saying that he'd found them in cemetery. Yeah, uh, I, that's what I was assuming. But From Robert Keller's book, Unhinged, as for the other bodies police had found, he said they were not murder victims but corpses he'd stolen from local cemeteries. Bizarre as the case had thus far proven to be, the officers were stunned by this latest admission. They were also disinclined to believe it, It seemed impossible that a man of Gein's stature could dig up a corpse, drag it from its casket, then fill the grave in again. All in a few hours he'd have to complete the task. But Ed was insistent, even providing the officers with a list of the graves he'd robbed. Mm. His M.O., he said, was to follow the obituaries in local newspapers looking for middle-aged women who had recently died. He'd then visit the graveyard late at night and get to work. The soil in the newly dug grave was still loose, and that made digging easy. Besides, Ed said, with his trademark grin, he never had to dig the full six feet. All of the coffins were encased in a wooden box, the lid of which was usually two feet just below the surface. All he had to do was pry up the boards with a crowbar, and he was in business. Sometimes he'd carry the whole corpse away with him. On other occasions, he'd cut off the head and leave the body behind. End quote. Oh. Uh, having worked in a cemetery, I can say, yes, you're never, you are not buried six feet deep. What? The hole might be six feet deep, but with the rough box and then the casket, you're probably buried about like four, three or four feet. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there's a, uh, you support what he's saying. I do. I can't imagine the pain of these families being notified that their dear departed loved ones had been dug up and desecrated and mutilated by this monster. Ed was charged with the two murders, of course. Yeah. Ed's attorney said they would be pursuing insanity as a defense. Also not a surprise. Mm -hmm. And they believed Ed was not even fit to stand trial. Ed was sent to Central State Hospital for the Criminally Insane for a month where he was evaluated. And I actually got copies of Ed Gein's psychological profile and his confessions and those kind of things. It's pretty fascinating stuff. Yeah. So I'm going to read a bit about Ed's personality makeup here. The subject is an introverted, odd, withdrawn personality that has had difficulty relating closely to other people. He also has shown some paranoid trends, but on the other hand, may have been duped and unfairly used on some occasions as he speaks of doing work for other farmers and failing to be paid for his labor. He is passive, inhibited, and somewhat evasive when questioned about the 
offense and may harbor deep-seated feelings of hostility. He denies ever having had a sexual experience and declares that in this connection he was taught the moral code by his mother that sexual experience before marriage was wrong. Quote, if a woman is good enough for intercourse, she is good enough for marriage. In his general reaction, immaturity and shyness are noted. A belief in spirits is also expressed by him, and he tends to be superstitious. <laughs> uh, his sexual history. Patient's early sexual information was given by the mother who impressed upon him the need for sexual abstinence prior to marriage. He indicated that she was not as strong in her admonitions against masturbation. He obtained additional information in a more uncouth manner from his classmates. He felt that morality was pretty low in Plainfield. Mm. He did go on to say in some of the later interviews that yep. uh, he did become sexually excited when he was doing his thing with the corpses. Oh, charming. Charming. And I won't go into it. Please don't. More deeply than that. Please, I appreciate that. He readily admitted that he heard his mother's voice telling him to be good several years after her death, and that on one occasion he had experienced what was probably an olfactory hallucination, that's smell, mm. in that he smelled what he thought was decaying flesh in the surrounding environment of his property. I don't know if that was a hallucination, because there was actually decaying flesh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 an abundance of it. Upon occasion, he stated that he had seen faces in piles of leaves. He may have dropped some. It couldn't be determined whether this was actually hallucinatory phenomena or an illusion. But hearing his mother's voice, mm -hmm. Norman Bates, mm -hmm. psycho, they go on to make some conclusions about Ed. The patient is very suggestible person who appears emotionally dull. Beneath this lies aggressiveness that may be expressed by inappropriate reactions that are followed by remorse and mild-manneredness. He is an immature person who withdraws and finds forming relationships with others difficult. He has rather rigid moral concepts which he expects others to follow. He is suspicious of others, tends to project blame for his own inadequacies onto others. His fantasy life is immature in nature, possibly pictures himself as a much more adequate and bigger man than he actually is. Yeah, yeah. Sexually, he is a conflicted individual and is functioning on an immature level. Guilt feelings are great and repression is put into use quite frequently in this, in this area. Mm. In general, it appears that this is basically a schizophrenic personality with several neurotic manifestations. At the present time, he is confused and has difficulty in looking at his situation realistically. Yeah, or rationally. He's not going to be, uh, he's definitely not a rational individual. No. So he was found uh, not fit to stand trial at that time. Oh, really? Yeah. And to the disgust of many Plainfields folks, he was sent back to the mental hospital. Mm. Some other things that I noticed, though, um, in his profile. Yep. Ed Gein enjoyed skiing. What a bizarre. Right? Well, they get snow in Wisconsin. I, yeah. So. But like you picture the Ed Gein that we know, mythological Ed Gein yeah, skiing. Yeah. Now, the big question though, Mike, would Ed, be, would Ed Gein be a downhill skier or a cross country skier? That's a great question. It really is. I think I cross know. country. I would think that it would yeah, be cross country as well so. because Wisconsin is, is pretty flat. Pra prairie like. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I don't, I see him being a cross country guy. Uh, although I get some entertainment visually picturing him skiing down some moguls in a. In, in the, in the uh, farmer's uh, hat and stuff. That yeah, you, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Ed Gein also played the violin. Oh, okay. And, and this is, this is from directly from the, uh, uh, the profile. He also played the mouth organ. <laughs> now there's a few jokes i'm gonna go with the one that is was it an actual did he make it out of mouths <laughs> there you go that's that's the, that's the that's, joke i'm going with that's what i was hoping for yeah yeah uh <laughs> but, but but did he play the skin flute oh god <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, classic me. Yeah, classic you. <laughs> After spending some time in the hospital, about 10 years, Ed was found uh, fit to stand trial. So, hmm. he's found guilty you of say. the murder okay. of Bernice Warden. They yeah. only tried him on the one. Oh, okay. And then later in sentencing, he was found to be insane at the time of the murder. So, back to the mental hospital goes oh, Ed. Okay. Eddie died mm -hmm. uh, in that hospital. Good. In <laughs> 1984. And they said he was a model patient. He was really... A, a nice and docile kind of guy who liked to write cards to people. and Well, as you can imagine, though, from that childhood of very, very strict, regimented, like he would thrive in that kind of an environment where everything, you're told what to do, everything's laid out. It was out. very structured. Yeah, and, exactly. And probably people were very kind to him there. Yeah, yeah. And he wasn't probably used to that. Yeah, wow. Uh, Ed was buried between his mother and brother, but there's no headstone as it was stolen. Oh, Okay. People also steal dirt from Ed's grave and sell it on the internet. I guess anything for a dollar now, eh? I did uh, see that is actually true. I was looking through some sites and I saw dirt from Ed Gein's graves graveyard. How would you authenticate Ed? that, though? It's like you could just get any dirt. Of course and, yeah. you could. His possessions were also treated poorly. Uh, the sheriff's department put Ed's home and all his belongings up for auction, and that was quite a sensational thing for people. I would imagine. But before anything could be sold, the house burned down in a mysterious fire, and everything in it was destroyed. I'm I'm going to say not an electrical fire. Ed's car was also a sideshow act of its very own, traveling all over for a time, and people would pay to see Eddie Gein's car. See, people are quick to criticize, uh, you know, our generation, the generations coming up about how, you know, oh, the internet and it's making everybody like. Well, yeah, unhealthy. they did you, this back stuff too. then. I mean, look, yeah, it was still it was happening. Totally, back then. they did. Uh, some people in the community felt that. Uh, Gallo's humor was only the only way to deal with Ed's horrific crimes. Mm -hmm. Enough. One particular macabre, and I warn you, offensively cold limerick that I found in Harold Schechter's book, Deviant, goes, There once was a man named Ed who wouldn't take a woman to bed. When he wanted to diddle, he cut out the middle and hung the rest in his shed. Oh, my God. That is... Isn't that horrific? <laughs> that is morbid. But I mean, it rhymed well. Yeah. Of note, documentarian Errol Morris mm. did his very first audio interview with Ed Gein in the hospital. I didn't know that. And Errol Mor Morris is one of my favorite uh, I documentarians. Love Errol Morris, yeah. 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 Thin Blue Line. Yes. Yeah. First person, his TV show is fantastic. Yeah. And he hasn't released this audio. Mm. He and Werner Herzog were actually planning an entire documentary on Ed Gein at one point. Oh, really? Yes, Werner Herzog. <laughs> you should give him a little shove. <laughs> so they were planning uh, an entire documentary <laughs> on Ed Gein. It's my favorite impression. They wanted to exhume Augusta as well to investigate whether Ed Gein had dug up his beloved mother. Just hearing you telling that, I would love to watch, just so I could hear Werner Herzog. They hear him say these things about <laughs> Ed Gein. I, I would actually very much like to see that documentary as well. Mm. I'm not sure why Errol Morris put a, put a hold on it. Perhaps he thought it was even a little too crazy for even him and <laughs> Werner. Yeah, yeah. But those two together, what an amazing documentary oh, they would God. make. It would be fantastic. Yes. Last summer, as I drove through Wisconsin, I yelled out the window, Hello, Wisconsin. Did you hear it From that else? 70s show? Yeah, I didn't really watch yeah, that anyway. show that much. I did consider a tour, a detour to Plainfield. Mm-hmm. But I didn't do it. I chickened out. I thought uh, I just didn't want to be another looky loo just coming to their town for that one. Yeah, reason. yeah. You know that there are sites where that's all that happens. That's all that. Yeah, they, yeah it's over there. The guy will point at me with disdain, judging yep. me. Yep. yep. Saying, yeah, it's over there. Much like I do. <laughs> so that 
my friends, is our second away game and <sighs> the story of Ed Gein. A disgusting man with a disgusting household. Yeah, his habits were not good. N- no, no. I mean, uh, I'm all for crafting. Like, you know, hey, man, get creative, you know, craft away. Maybe leave human flesh out of the mix. Oh, good God. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. Just, you know, lampshades can be made out of other materials. Go with those. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Terrible. Terrible. Yeah. Yeah, it was gooder, though. All right, before we go, we want to say thank you to our latest Patreon patrons. First up, Eric Smith from Elkhart, Indiana. Oh. I drove through Indiana as well. Yeah, you drove through a lot of places. I did. Also, mm-hmm. another place uh, I drove through was Spokane, Washington, and that's where Natalie Chapin is from. I like Spokane. Never been there, but I know a fair amount about Spokane. I like it. It was it was a good place. I think I was in the wrong neighborhood there. Oh. But uh, it seemed like a, not a bad city. Yeah. Libby Green from Glasgow. Lang- Lanarkshire. Lanarkshire. Uh, yeah. Glasgow, Lanarkshire in the Great Britain. Yes. Yes. Interesting. Oh, hi, Libby. Uh, Thank you also to Stella Chen and Donald Brown. Uh, Brown without an E. Donald actually emailed me and I thought, oh, it's my uncle. Uh But it was not (laughs) because I have an uncle, Don. Oh, well, hey, Donald and Stella. So I have a feeling that this name is one that uh, (laughs) the person knows I'm going to screw up, but I'm going to give it a shot. Her name is Janelle and her last name is Betley. B E T L E J. I think you're spot on. Janelle Betley. And she's from Eagle River, Arkansas. Sweet. Arkansas. Arkansas. I think that's our first. I was going to say, I don't remember hearing any other Arkansas. Our first person from Arkansas. So who knows how Janelle found us or the rest of you folks. <laughs> but we are grateful for your support oh, of the show. Oh my God, are we ever. So thank you so much. Oh. oh, and I wanted to mention, actually, I've neglected to mention just now, Libby from Glasgow yeah. upped her pledge, what? which is why we what? mentioned her, and now she's a PM. Oh. So we have a uh, a PM from Glasgow. Well, that is so great. It's pretty neat. Seriously. It is pretty neat. Isn't, are there, how many Glasgow's are there? Is that, isn't that in, it's in Scotland, isn't it? I would think so. Yeah, as I have family, that's where we're thinking. I think that's where a lot of my family came from. Well, I don't think we should be Googling it right now, but uh, maybe later. No, no, let's let's go into Ancestry.com for me. Go into Ancestry.com? Yeah. yeah. No, I'm kidding. Don't. Well, no, that's what I'm going to do. No, I'm not actually going to do that. Because <laughs> that, would, yeah, no. I had an Ancestry thing once, but just let it go. So thank you to all our good eggs. Uh, Thank you to our patrons past and present for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. And if you yourself want to support us, you can do so at patreon.com slash dark poutine. Or for a one-time donation, you can send us some donut money via PayPal at our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. And we sincerely, sincerely appreciate everything that anybody's ever contributed. It's going to it's it's gonna help Scott in Australia. <laughs> yeah, yes. well, any, a couple extra pennies will help me out there. Exactly. Oh, shit, do I have to get my money converted? Yes. Oh, damn it. Check out our website, www.darkpoutine.com, for show notes and other cool stuff. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine and tell your friends. Join the Umber Yard on Face Group. That's uh, Face Group. <laughs> join the Umber Yard on Facebook. That's our closed group where you can meet us and some other cool listeners. We just had a meetup in Victoria. Oh, it was a blast. That was awesome. It really, really was. Thank you to everybody who came out. You were all awesome possums. E- uh, even to my, my good friend Heidi who came out and she won't be hearing this because she doesn't listen. Yeah. But she's it was really cool to have a friend She's come buddy, out yeah. and she fit in great with everybody. So it was really, it was a great time. You can subscribe to us on your favorite podcast directory, like iTunes, podcast, Google play, Stitcher, tune in or Spotify, wherever else you get your on demand audio. Good.
And our promo this week is from the 36 Times podcast hey. in uh, Nova Scotia. Yeah, yeah. So Lily and Krista, thanks for giving us a promo this week. Whoop, whoop. Hey, Lily. Oh, hey, Krista. Did you know, according to an unproven internet meme, you will cross paths with a murderer 36 times in your lifetime? I did know that, and you want to know why? I can guess. Because we're 36 Times, a Canadian true crime and comedy podcast, which covers crimes in the Great White North. Every episode, we focus on a major crime, and then we lighten things up with a kooky one. We cover everything from major cases and unsolved mysteries to peculiar getaway choices and animals behaving oddly. So catch our bi-weekly episodes on iTunes or wherever you find your podcasts. That is it for our show. And we'll end with what we usually do, which is don't forget to be good egg and not a bad apple. Bye-bye, everybody. See ya.